Hi guys, this is our next section of our chapter on genetics, ch chapter eight. This is a set of, or a video looking through the slides on transcription and translation for prokaryotic cells. Let me share our, whoops, share our PowerPoint. This is attempt number two at this video, so hopefully it'll work this time. Okay, we just finished talking through, or the last video was talking through the process of DNA replication, understanding how that double-stranded DNA molecule looks on its structural level, and then how it replicates um, to form two identical daughter cells with um, the same exact duplication of that original DNA molecule. Now remember this happens only one time during the process of cell division, right before the process of cell division. But let's look at this other basic tenet of genetics, which is understanding how DNA is transcribed into RNA and then translated into a polypeptide, which then can be folded into a final protein product or an enzyme. This process of transcription first uh, involves some basic machinery. I think we talked through some of these basic outlines in the last sets of slides, so let's look at the details here. We're gonna be focusing on how that double-stranded DNA molecule, and remember this is prokaryotic cells, <clears throat> so we are working, uh, we are looking at a single. <laughs> okay, we are talking about a double stranded DNA molecule, prokaryotic cell, therefore, we're talking about a single chromosome. And remember, we had mentioned this in our last set of slides. Hopefully, my my pen marker or my pen tool will be working here. Let's turn it to black. So remember we talked about how DNA has different regions on here that are encoding regions, right? And we, of course, are calling these genes, but for prokaryotic cells, they group their genes together into operons. So let's just call, Brenda search. I do not know why my pen tool does not like to stay as a pen tool. I'm sorry, people. Let's see for the work here. So we are calling these regions, or of course, an encoding region of DNA that turns into a protein, and this is not working for me, is a gene. I'm just not gonna write it on here. A gene. That gene <laughs> is then encoded into, or turned into a protein read by host machinery, first transcribed into messenger RNA, and then translated into protein or polypeptide. Let's see if I can write something down here. I'm not sure why my pad is giving me so much problem. So this is messenger RNA, this intermediate. Hmm. Messenger RNA is what's actually transcribed from that gene and then translated into that polypeptide product, that protein. The Smaller subunit here on the ribosome itself is the ribosomal RNA. Ribosome, ribosomal RNA. And this is then that subunit, that small subunit. And we have these transfer RNA molecules also that can be generated from this process. It's a transfer RNA molecule. These ones are really important in bringing in amino acids. I'll say amino acid carrier. So all of these RNA molecules are generated through the process of transcription. So understand that. We're gonna just follow through the process of transcribing a messenger RNA molecule that then is turned into that protein product, right? Or the polypeptide. Now note also there are other types of RNAs that can be generated besides these three main ones involved in protein production. These can be regulatory, or these are all types of regulatory RNAs. So other regions on that DNA that are not encoding for any of these protein um, synthesis machinery or that messenger RNA. These can all be involved in regulating um, the cell processes or even the synthesis of these different proteins. So this can be um, microRNAs, these very small RNA molecules that can go and bind to different regions of DNA, interfering RNA, antisense RNA, and others here. We're not going to talk about any of these things. You can read about them in your textbook. 
this is a little bit more of, of our modern understanding of how um, genetics really works in the cell and is regulated and helps regulate cell processes. But we're going to keep it simple and focus on protein synthesis over here. So let's start with transcription. This is a cool, excuse me, I'm going to sneeze. <sighs> Excuse me. This is a cool electron micrograph of an actual mRNA transcript. And this in prokaryotic cells, well, actually, this is the same in, in eukaryotic cells, but each of these things coming off of this <laughs> DNA molecule are each mRNA transcripts that can then go and be fed into that ribosomal machinery to each make individual proteins. So this is a, a very rapid process, and many, many, many transcripts can be generated from that exact same protein sequence or gene sequence on the DNA at any given time. This is kind of our more simplified process. We're going to look at just made one major enzyme involved in this transcriptional machinery. But understand that, of course, if you get into molecular biology and, and study genetics, then you'll see that this is a lot more complicated than I'm looking at showing you here. Oh, goodness sakes. Um, so first, let's look at the structure of RNA versus DNA. So DNA, we mentioned, <laughs> excuse me, is deoxyribonucleic acid uh, because of that deoxyribo sugar, where that two prime carbon has no hydroxy group on it. Ribonucleic acid or ribonucleotides have a hydroxylated uh, two prime carbon. So you'll see that here, the biggest difference between these uh, core nucleotide structures. Another difference that you'll see between DNA nucleotides and RNA nucleotides is the replacement of uracil with, or the replacement of thymine with uracil. <laughs> Honestly, I was out here all day and I didn't sneeze at all. These, these nitrogenous bases look very similar. I'll show you a picture of their um, molecular makeup in just a second and you'll see that they do have similarities in structure. And therefore, their rules of binding or um, base pairing is, is uh, actually the same as what we saw with DNA. And then also for RNA, these guys exist, these entire RNA molecules exist as single-stranded linear molecules, like you see here, instead of double-stranded molecules like we saw with DNA. Otherwise, note that the structure is basically the same. We have a nitrogenous base bound to that one prime carbon. There's your two prime carbon that has a hydroxy group on it, three prime carbon bound to the adjacent nucleotide here four prime carbon, five prime bound to that phosphate group, right? So here's our, our ribose sugar, a nitrogenous base, and our phosphate group that connects these two different um, uh, nucleotides together. Here's a better picture, again, illustrating these four major differences between DNA and RNA. Let's just write those things down real quickly, the things we just mentioned here. Hopefully my pen will work this time. So one difference between DNA and RNA. Oops, let's write down DNA versus RNA. DNA exists as a double-stranded molecule, whereas RNAs are single-stranded. These RNAs, um, you know, these nitrogenous spaces, they're, they're quite reactive. They don't like to be alone, essentially, and so they will bind to something, but usually uh, what RNAs do is they just fold back in on themselves to form some really unique structures. So we'll see that actually with tRNA in just a minute. DNA uh, has, uh, actually let's just write the sugar just so you have that down. This is the deoxyribose, deoxyribose versus a ribose sugar. And again, it's based on that two prime OH group here. And then for our nitrogenous bases, DNA, of course, has A's, C's, G's, and T's, thymine, versus RNAs can have adenines, cytosines, guanines, and instead of thymines, they place this with uracil. Right, so these uh, are the key differences between a, a DNA molecule and an RNA molecule. Now let's just mention though, we do still have the same rule of binding or rule of base pairing, and this becomes important. I think we're still in black. Nope. Sometimes this works and sometimes it doesn't. I'm not quite sure why.
So our rule of, of pairing is important to understand. Uh, and I'll just mention if we're pairing DNA to ay, 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 DNA to RNA, <laughs> doesn't like me to draw lines. So during the process of transcription is what we're talking about. When DNA has an adenine, RNA, of course, I just mentioned, it does not have thymines, it has uracils instead. This uracil, if you look at the molecular structure, you'll see this is very similar. Sorry, you only see my forehead there. You'll see the molecular structure is very similar to thymines, and uh, therefore it actually can bind in a similar pattern as uh, thymines do too. So when DNA has an adenine, then RNA will, will pair with a uracil. When DNA has a thymine, then RNA will pair with an adenine. When DNA has a cytosine, RNA will pair with a guanine. And when DNA has a guanine, RNA will pair with a cytosine. Okay, so you do still have the same rule of pair, pairing here, just with this one exception, where instead of thymines binding to adenines, uh, we have uracils instead. <clears throat> so the process of transcription is uh, quite simple. Actually, we're just going to look at it as simple as this. There are two key things that you do need to note, and let's actually just draw a very brief picture of this really quickly. All right. So for uh, transcription, first let's just mention that you know, let's let's go back up and draw our double-stranded DNA molecule. And sorry, my circles are horrible. So remember, if this is our chromosome, our DNA, then there are particular gene segments here for operons that have multiple genes on them that are actually our encoding region, right? So I'm going to call this an operon, but we know this is a cluster of genes. So the cell needs to know where essentially to begin this process of transcription and where to end it, right? There are regions of this DNA that are not encoded or do not have any encoding to turn into proteins. So the cell recognizes the beginning of these things by a sequence of nucleic acid that is termed a promoter. Promoter. And you'll find a promoter at the front of every gene segment. And again, this is sort of this initiation or how the cell knows where to begin the process of transcription. Now also here, and I, we're not going to talk about this quite yet, but I'm, I'm just going to add it in since we're drawing our diagram. Also at the beginning, you'll find under almost every example here, you'll also find something called an operator. And again, this is just a sequence of nucleic acid that is the signal for something. And I'm just going to draw in front of most of these things. It's not on every single operon, but you'll find it on most of these things. And so the operator, whereas the promoter is the initiation of transcription, the operator, let's just call this the on-off switch. It's the regulatory site. Back in chapter seven, when we were talking about enzyme regulation at the synthesis level, essentially we were talking about this region here, the operator region, that on-off switch. And we'll look at that in more detail in just a minute. Versus the promoter, this is the start of transcription, uh, because this is where RNA, polymerase, the key molecule or the key enzyme involved in transcription, polymerase, RNA polymerase binds to begin equals begin translation, transcription, sorry. 
Okay, so we have the binding site of our polymerase, which is our enzyme involved in transcription. We have our regulatory site here, and now you should be going, well, what about how to end this thing? Yes, indeed, there is a region. Again, a sequence of nucleic acid at the end of these regions, and this is called the terminator. This is the terminator. Which, as you can guess, this is the sequence that signals the end of transcription. All right, so now we can go back to our image and we'll see how this whole process works or back to our slides. So here again, uh, the key enzyme involved in the transcription process is the RNA polymerase. It's a big giant molecule. In fact, it's a whole complex of molecules. Um, your book may talk about the sigma factor too. This is, in, this is needed to bind to the polymerase in order to actually initiate this um, transcription process, but we're just gonna keep it simple and use this one key enzyme as the, the initiator and the, in fact, the entire complex itself. So the polymerase recognizes that sequence of nucleic acid called the promoter. This is very similar in every, actually there are key promoter sequences that are shared universally among all prokaryotic cells. We have promoters for eukaryotic cells too. And so actually if you are a geneticist, you can take a giant just screen of nucleic acid. And if you know what you're looking for, you essentially can find the beginning of a gene segment or an operon for polymerases uh, or for um, prokaryotic cells by looking for that particular sequence of nucleic acid. Once you have the polymerase bound to the promoter region, as long as there is no inhibition uh, at that operator region, then this polymerase may begin this elongation process, wherein uh, the polymerase will essentially open up that double-stranded DNA molecule. It will use one of these strands as the template, only one, because we are only generating one transcript, a single-stranded molecule as a transcript. And as it opens and reads the um, the nitrogenous bases, the nucleotides on that template will allow RNA uh, nucleotides to come and bind very briefly, temporarily, as it reads through the sequence and form those bonds, those adjacent bonds, um, phosphodiester bonds between these adjacent nucleotides. And then essentially, as soon as it passes this one particular region of that DNA, then the DNA will just re anneal or close right back up again. And this process will continue all the way until the terminator region is reached at the end of that double stranded DNA molecule, and at which point the polymerase complex will fall off, the mRNA will disassociate and form something called a hairpin loop uh, to terminate that process. And, um, and uh, then this process can continue again, or the mRNA transcript can move on into uh, translation. Let's look at this. Um, actually, I'll, I'll mention a couple of things here. So in this image, you see that double-stranded DNA molecule. Remember, strand orientation is important to understand. Here's that five prime end and the three prime end here on this, what, we, what is called the plus strand of DNA. On the minus strand, this blue guy, it's three to five prime orientation. Now, un importantly, the RNA polymerase works just like the DNA polymerase in that it must have that three prime carbon available to elongate or continue this elongation process. So because of this, that means that transcription will also occur in the five to three prime orientation, right? So the new strand, new strand is built from the five to the three prime direction right, orientation. So the new strand is made five to three because that three prime carbon must always be available for elongation to occur. So if you look at the red guy and the blue guy, which of these things, understanding the rule of complementary binding and strand orientation, which of these ones will be the template for this mRNA transcript? Well, you should be thinking about orientation and, and the rule of complementary binding. So if the new strand will be made in the five to three prime orientation, that means the template must be in the three to five prime orientation, or in our picture here, it would be the blue strand, right? So in, in our case here, the blue strand would be our template.
the template, right? Because only one of these two will be will be actually encoded or read by that RNA polymerase. That means the three to five prime strand orientation or the minus strand is what is termed here is the template, okay? The plus strand is not, but if you read the sequence on the plus strand, you'll find that it actually matches what you find on that mRNA transcript with the exception of the T's. My T's are, are changed into U's, but it's actually the, the, oh my gosh, it's actually <laughs> the template, that three to five prime strand that is, uh, that is transcribed here. Right? So T is again complementary to A. So you'll find that the mRNA transcript has an adenine here. A's in DNA are complementary to uracils in RNA. Cytosines in DNA are complementary to guanines in RNA. Guanines are complementary to cytosines. Adenines complementary to uracils, right? And so on and so forth. So you can, you can see how this uh, process occurs and how you get this mRNA transcript from reading and um, uh, bringing complementary RNA nucleotides to bind for these DNA nucleotides here. I'm running out of light out here. This picture is halfway decent. This is from your textbook. Again, this is showing you um, the initiation event where that RNA polymerase will come and bind to that promoter sequence. And at that site, or essentially it's a little bit downstream, but um, at this initiation region, the codon, it will open up this double-stranded DNA molecule and only read one of the two strands. The template strand is one that's actually used. Just to confuse you, one that's not used as a template, it's called the coding strand, but, it, but essentially if you read the sequence on the coding strand, it will match what is made on that mRNA transcript. But it's actually the template strand in the three to five prime orientation that acts as the template for that transcriptional event. So here where, you, here where there is a transcriptional event, that double strand DNA molecule will open and those nucleotides on the template will be read by that RNA polymerase and those RNA nucleotides will come in and bind with complementarity to that DNA template. But note that as soon as that polymerase complex passes that region of DNA, that mRNA transcript is essentially kicked off of that double stranded DNA molecule. The DNA will just re-anneal, close right back up again as soon as this polymerase passes through this region. And in that way, DNA can continuously be read over and over and over again by this transcriptional machinery and is not changed in this process. This continues all the way until that terminator region is reached wherein everything kind of falls off. So let me show you this picture just one more time. I like this a little bit better because it shows you that transcription is occurring at the site of this RNA polymerase complex. So as soon as this polymerase complex moves past, and if you recall back when we were looking at at DNA polymerase and the whole elongation process. We saw how this enzyme is a giant uh, enzyme and sits upon a very wide section of that DNA. So, so there is a large region where this complex occurs that opens up that double-stranded DNA molecule and so that the nucleotides can be read by transcriptional machinery. Come here. And, <laughs> and so as soon as this this um, DNA is read here, and that uh, polymerase passes through, uh, then that DNA will close right back up again. And so here you can see a close-up picture of this complementary binding where these nucleotides, and actually in this picture, you can challenge yourself a little bit and figure out which of these things is RNA and which is the DNA template. You can figure it out based on presence of your cells and bindings. So in this picture here, we have the pink as RNA, and the blue as DNA. It's a good way to, to test yourself. So these um, complementary RNA nucleotides will come and bind, and this process moves all along until the terminator region is reached, at which point the RNA polymerase dissociates, that mRNA transcript is kicked off, and can then be read by the ribosomal machinery. Again, there are three different types of RNA that can be generated from, or that are generated from this transcriptional event. These are messenger RNA, ribosomal RNA that will actually bind with ribosomal proteins to form the ribosome itself, and these transfer RNA complexes or molecules that bind with amino acids to form something called amino acyl transfer RNAs that come into the ribosomal complex in this next part of translation. 
So work through this one on your own. You can pause the video here and make sure you can do this trans transcription event. So this question says transcribe the following double-stranded DNA molecule. The first thing you need to think of is which is my template? Remember again that RNA polymerase must have that three prime carbon available. Therefore, transcription occurs in the same direction as we talked about replication. The new strand is made from five to three prime orientation, right? So pause here for just a minute. We'll pause the video, hopefully. Work through this problem and let me do it with you. Okay. So you first need to decide which of these strands is going to be your template. Hopefully you identified the bottom one is gonna be your template. Because of orientation, right? Because we know that our new strand will be in the five to three prime orientation. So to answer this question, you'll first start by telling me strand orientation. So the new transcript will be five prime. And then you can identify guanines bind to cytosines. Thymines will bind to adenines. Adenines bind to uracils and so on and so forth, right? G, C, A, blah, blah, blah. I'll let you finish this one. Can't see my keys anymore. Okay, now we're ready to move on to the process of translation. And in fact, if you're watching this video at home, please stop it here and go in and watch the videos that I've posted on our Canvas page to help you understand this process of both transcription and translation. I think it's definitely important, especially for this chapter on genetics, to visualize this process with computer animations so you can more, more um, easily solidify this and assimilate this information. Once you're done watching that video, come back and join me here. So let's walk through this process of translation. Translation is the process by which that mRNA transcript is then read by ribosomal machineries and uh, translated into a polypeptide product. And remember polypeptides, that means many peptides, which are amino acids. So the most simple product of translation is a string of amino acids grouped together that then can be further modified into a final protein product. This involves a series of, of pieces of this ribosomal machinery. But first, let's talk about some basic concepts here. This mRNA, the information that we see encoded by the sequence of nucleotides in messenger RNA, can be deciphered by what we call the genetic code. This genetic code is um, based on codons that are associated with particular, with particular amino acids. Now, one of the most mind-blowing things is to consider that on the planet Earth, every single organism that is living, based on our definition, that means that they replicate with DNA, every single one has the same basic genetic information and the same deciphering, um, the same deciphering mechanisms using this genetic code. That's a really phenomenal concept altogether. So let's look at what this means. So a codon is a sequence of three nucleotides in a row. Any three nucleotides could be considered a codon, any three adjacent nucleotides. In this picture here, this is showing you codons. Whoops, sorry, let me go back. Okay, in this picture here, this is showing you uh, an identification or delineation of the first three nucleotides in a row as the first codon. This in messenger RNA is associated with the first three nucleotides in messenger RNA as the first codon. And then if you were to look up the, these three nucleotides in a row, for example, if these three nucleotides were, let's just do an example, A, U, and G. If you were to look up A, U, G on a chart that I'll show you in just a minute, we can see that it is always associated with an F-methionine. And backwards, kind of moving backwards, we would see that this coding sequence of DNA is ATG, that the complementary DNA, whoops, geez, my mic keeps doing that. You can't really see that. The complementary region of DNA would be T, A, C, right? If this is A, T, 
G. So if our double-stranded DNA molecule looked like this, ATG is the first three, are the first three nucleotides, the complements would be TAC. If this were our three prime end, then we know that our transcript five prime end has AUG as the first three nucleotides. This would be the first codon. And again, if you were to look at the associated transfer RNA bringing in the first amino acid, you would find it's always encoded or it always is associated with an F-methionine. So each of these sequences of three nucleotides in a row would be considered a codon. A codon is three, three nucleotides, three adjacent nucleotides, or three nucleotides in a row. These nucleotides, if you were just to do a statistical analysis, we have four nucleotides that make up all of the ribosomal, um, possible ribosomal nucleotides that we have available for us. If you were to combine them in sets of three, like I just did, AUG, for example, AAA, CCC, go on, so on and so forth, then you would find that this could generate, statistically speaking, about uh, 64 different sequences of three. So 64 different codons altogether, sequences of three nucleotides. Now, there are only 20 amino acids, so therefore we have redundancy, which means that some codons, multiple co I'm sorry, some amino acids are actually associated to multiple codons. And you can see this in our genetic code. So here's a codon chart and one that I want you to become familiar with. It's a really common one, um, and this is a messenger RNA codon chart. Now this lists all of those 64 possible variations of those three nucleotides, uh, of those four nucleotides put in groups of three or three codons, or three nucleotides that makes a codon. To read this particular chart, you would start here with the first base position. So let's go back to our example of AUG. For AUG, the first nucleotide is A here. And then on the top part of our chart is the second base position. So again, AUG, so our first base position is A here. Second base position is U. So we're down in this box here. And then on this side, this is the third base position. And it's just for each of these individual rows. It's AC or ACA, UCA, and G is in that order. So again, we would go first base is adenine, second base is uracil, and the third base is guanine. So we would find AUG right here. And again, AUG is always associated with the F-methionine, which if you note on our codon chart, this is always the start of a translational product. This is always the first codon and the first amino acid that initiates this translational um, process. Up here, there's a couple more to note. So A, uh, UAA and UAG and UGA, all three of these codons um, terminate the process of translation. So these we call stop codons. They're codons that do not have an amino acid associated with them. And if the ribosomal complex reaches these nucleotides, when they reach any of these nucleotides, they will terminate the process of translation. So stop that process here. The redundancy concept you can see here, for example, with proline, this amino acid has four different codons that are associated with it. So anytime you're reading an mRNA sequence, you come upon CCC, CCU, CCA, or CCG, all of these amino acids all encode for a proline. This becomes important downstream or later on in our conversation when we look at mutations and how some mutations actually have no effect on the protein because of this concept of redundancy. So let's keep going and I'll explain to you how this whole thing works. For um, figuring out how to decipher what the sequence actually encodes for, the mRNA sequence, you first have to think, where do you begin reading? And so we need to talk about this concept of reading frames. Now, before I show you that picture, let me just give you an example of what we understand in the English language for reading frames. Say you were to open up a book and you came across, across something that looks like this. Okay, obviously you are trained to know what this strange phrase here is, is um, actually encoding, what this means. Uh, but if you didn't know, and I told you a couple of basic rules, you could follow this along. So if you tried to start reading from the very first letter in the sequence, this would make no sense to you, especially if I told you that these are three-letter words 
that you can find in this sequence. That would mean that you're reading this as a three letter word and this as a three letter word and this as a three letter word. Obviously it makes no sense. But instead of this, I told you that in our language, we begin a, a phrase with a capital letter and we end it with a period. Now you can essentially bypass anything that comes before that capital letter and say, oh, I'm beginning my reading here. And I told you again, these are three letter words. Here's your first three letter word, your second three letter word, your third one. And then I told you again, we end our phrases with a period. And so we would terminate, we would terminate <laughs> our phrase here and discount everything that goes after it, right? The same concept occurs in messenger RNA. So for this messenger RNA sequence at the top, you could begin reading with the very first letter and group these into groups of three nucleotides in a row that makes one codon. This would be their reading frame number one where you begin at that first site. Now notice the grouping of each of these three nucleotides in a row for all of these codons creates this particular sequence that when you go back to our genetic code chart, you would find this series of amino acids associated with this codon sequence. AUG, I've already mentioned, is associated with an F-methionine. GCA, if you were to go back to our codon chart, you would find is associated with an alanine, and so on and so forth. But look up here, if I told you to discount that adenine and begin reading at this second nucleotide, now the groupings of every three nucleotides in a row creates reading frame number two sequence, which is completely different, has a completely different amino acid series or sequence or combination as we saw the first time around. Now our first codon is UGG, which again, going back to that codon chart, you would find associated with a tryptophan. CAU is associated with a histidine, UGC associated with a cysteine, and so on. Finally, if we were to skip the first two nucleotides and begin grouping with that third nucleotide, we would find reading frame number three down here as our sequence. So GGC would be our first codon, AUU, so on. And each of these, if you look them up in the codon chart, you would find this particular sequence of amino acids. Now note again that reading frame number one, number two, and number three generate completely different polypeptide um, sequences, right? So a completely different one for reading frame one, two, and three. This is super important. So how does the cell know where to begin reading? Well, it's, it's um, the AUG. So AUG is the start codon, always associated with F-methionine. So when we are, for our sake, we're gonna again, keep it kind of simple. For our sake, if you are transcribing and translating and you're trying to figure out where to start that translation process, you would search through until you found the first A, U, G, circle that and begin the um, groupings of your nucleotides or groupings of your codons from that reading frame, okay? The reading frame is based on where you begin the process of translation and it always begins with A, U, G. The key machinery involved in the translation process are the ribosomes and the transfer RNAs. These guys are really important and these are sort of our intermediates between transcription and translation. These transfer molecules that bind to very particular amino acids and they have a region on them called an anticodon that is how they bind to and bring those amino, uh, amino acids in association with these mRNA um, molecules. They look something like this, call this a clover leaf or a clover leaf shape. <laughs> so they kind of look like little three leaf clovers. Uh, and this is based on the single stranded transfer RNA molecule that sort of makes these internal bonds with, it, with itself, these hydrogen bonds. And this forms these two really key parts of this molecule. At the bottom, we find an anticodon. Now this anticodon is just a sequence of nucleotides that, has, that, that are able to bind co with complementarity to a messenger RNA molecule. And there's only three nucleotides, so a codon, that is called an anticodon because it binds complementary to a codon on mRNA. Now for every transfer molecule, every transfer molecule has a unique anticodon. Again, we said that there are 60 possible, 64 possible 
um, codons available just based on the different arrangements of, the, of those four nucleotides, and 61 of them encode for amino acids. So you'll find 61 various transfer molecules with those complementary anticodons here, and each of them are associated with a very particular amino acid. This is a, a better computer-generated computer image of what these things look like. But again, note the two really important parts of this, the anticodon that can bind to messenger RNA and the amino acid binding site here at the top. Now this bond here is a covalent bond, but uh, it can be broken and is broken during the process of translation inside the ribosomal complex. Here is a snapshot, snapshot, a snippet of what this process looks like. So here is the double-stranded DNA molecule. Again, we have the blue as the coding strand here and the red as the template strand. Uh, of course, this is the reverse image of what we were seeing before. Now, don't be confused in this picture. Even though there's a gap between these codons, there is no gap between codons in a DNA or mRNA uh, molecule. But let's just read this. So here's our template strand, TAC. We know that during the process of transcription, that RNA polymerase will read this and associate these mRNA nucleotides. So A's are complementary to, I'm sorry, T's are complementary to A's. A's are complementary to U's. C's are complementary to G's. For translation, the ribosomal complex will essentially search through until it finds this first ribosomal docking site. And then the first transfer molecule that has the anticodon or the complementary ribosomal nucleotides as this first start codon, the AUG, will enter into the ribosomal complex. So here's that transfer molecule. These anticodons would read UAC, a right, complementary to AUG. This transfer molecule would come into the ribosomal machinery, dock right here at that binding site. And these guys have the F-methionine and they would be, bring this F-methionine in. The next transfer molecule that has the anticodon that's complementary to the next codon in mRNA. So if this is CUG, you would expect GAC here as the anticodon found on this next transfer molecule that would come and dock here. This CUG amino acid or codon happens to associate with the amino acid leucine. So this transfer molecule that has GAC as the anticodon is always bound to a leucine molecule here. This would come and dock right next to this first transfer RNA. And so now we have these two amino acids docked next to each other. A bond will be formed and you can continue this process along. So for shorthand understanding, you should be able to take this double-stranded DNA molecule, transcribe it into messenger RNA, and then translate it into amino acids, understanding that there are anticodons that are this intermediate between the mRNA and the amino acids. So I like to challenge, challenge my students to be able to take that mRNA transcript and actually find the associated anticodons, and then from here, understand the associated amino acids to that. So I'll show you how to do this whole process here in just a second. But let's look through conceptually what's actually occurring during this translational process. Number one is initiation. The ribosome binds to the mRNA at something called the ribosomal binding site. So that mRNA transcript, really, as soon as it is made, as soon as it begins the process, the cell begins the process of transcription, and the ribosomal docking station or ribosomal binding site becomes available on that mRNA transcript, the small subunit will come and dock or bind right underneath an mRNA transcript, and that allows that first transfer molecule that has that anticodon to AUG, so that C, I'm sorry, U. A C anticodon will come and dock and bring in that very first methionine. So the, the translational process actually begins at the first AUG. Once you have this docking, then you can have elongation. All this stuff probably looks pretty complex, so let's just look at the picture first. This is the ribosomal complex itself. Again, the small subunit will dock first at the ribosomal binding site. The very first transfer molecule will come and dock next at the AUG on mRNA, bringing in an F-methionine. Once that occurs, the larger subunit will come and bind and form these very particular stocking stations here. Now we can have elongation occur. So the P site is called the, the let's add these terms in here. The P site, P-E-PEP, 
peptidyl site. This is where we have the first transfer RNA molecule binds. I'm not sure why that line came here. The first transfer RNA molecule docks. And then all subsequent um, transfer molecules will dock in the A site. But this is also the site where the peptide bond is formed. Peptide bond is formed between the P site or from the P site, ay, 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 from the P site to the A site, the amino acid here. Okay, the A site, you can call this the acceptor site to keep it simple because all acceptor, all incoming transfer RNA molecules dock here. This is also this is specifically called the amino acyl site um, because this is where all of the amino acyl transfer RNA molecules will come in, right? But you can just keep this as simple as the acceptor site. I don't care what you call it, but this is the amino acyl or the acceptor site. Essentially, just remember that all incoming transfer molecules will come and dock at the A site. A peptide bond is formed between the amino acid on the P site with the amino acid that's on that transfer molecule on the A site. As soon as that peptide bond is formed, this covalent bond is broken between this transfer molecule and its amino acid. Once this occurs, this peptide bond is formed, then we call this uh, a process called ribosomal translocation occurs, where the entire ribosomal unit will shift down one spot, one codon, on the mRNA, and once that occurs, it will essentially allow this empty transfer molecule to leave through the exit site, the E or the exit site. That will move or shift. This transfer molecule will shift to the P site, the peptidyl site where that growing peptide chain is, and will open up that new codon at that new A site or at the A site for a new transfer molecule to come in. So let's step backwards one more time. Oops forward. So this elongation occurs, right? Again, the very first transfer molecule that brings in the first amino acid, which is always in the thionine, will bind and dock at that P site, will we'll bind and dock at the mRNA, and then the ribosomal complex will bind here, so that the transfer molecule is sitting in the P or the vital site. That will lay, allow the A site to be available and open. The amino acyl site, or the acceptor, is how you can phrase this thing. This is where all incoming transfer RNA molecules will come and dock. Once the, both the P site and the A site are filled, there is an enzyme that creates a peptide bond between these amino acids from the P site to the A site. And then the entire ribosome itself will translocate or shift down one codon, which allows all those that transfer molecules stay where they are. So the ribosome itself will shift, but everything on that mRNA molecule stays where, they, where it is, which means that that empty now transfer molecule will leave through the exit site and uh, the uh, A site is now available for the next ribosome to bind. Let's look at this process here. Here again the very first so we have the ribosome uh, subunit dock at that um, mRNA. It moves along until that transfer RNA that first transfer molecule can dock at that um, P site and the larger subunit comes and binds. So here's that AUG on the mRNA. There's the anticodon UAC found on this particular transfer molecule that has an F-methionine associated with it. Once this initiation event occurs, now we have the opening of that A site available for binding. Here's the next transfer molecule. In this case, CC CCG is the next codon sitting at the A site. So we know the anticodon GGC will come and dock at this site here. This particular transfer molecule that has GGC on it is always associated with a proline. You can look this one up on our codon uh, chart. Once these two, the P site and the A site, are um, docked, then we have a peptide bond formed at the top here. So there's an enzyme that makes this peptide bond between the F-methionine and the proline. In the process, it, uh, it breaks that covalent bond from this transfer molecule and its amino acid. This transfer molecule is essentially empty and needs to go pick up a new amino acid. So this whole ribosome itself will translocate or shift down one codon. Here's the next codon, UAC. 
So you'll see that when this whole ribosome moves along the mRNA, now that UAC site becomes, um, sits in that A site, that empty, this empty transfer molecule will exit through this E site. So once that ribosome shifts down, that E site kicks out that transfer molecule. This transfer molecule that has that growing polypeptide chain has just been shifted to the P site. So now we have at the P site the methionine and the, and the proline docked together or bound together. And now we have an incoming transfer molecule that has an anticodon that matches that codon on the uh, RNA and it brings in its associated amino acid. So this is the elongation process and will continue all the way along until the stop codon is reached, right? And so you'll have this continuous ribosomal translocation where you have this growing elongating polypeptide all the way until a stop codon is reached where the mRNA's A site, amino acyl site, is docked on a, a stop codon. This will terminate or, uh, yeah, terminate this translational process where everything dissociates and that polypeptide can now get folded into a protein product. This is also from your book. I don't know if that last one was either was too, but this is from your book showing you the same process and you can kind of move yourself along. This one's showing you, um, yeah. So termination again occurs when that ribosome reaches that stop codon on the mRNA. There are release factors that come, break the bonds between that last transfer molecule and the polypeptide to, to release that free polypeptide. There must be post-translational modifications that occur to that polypeptide where there are additional proteins that help in the internal fo folding and the subunit binding to form that final protein product. There are signal sequences, just so you know, that are, that are on the polypeptide that help tag that protein for either external transport for exoenzymes or for internal um, regional or transportation translocation inside the cell along the cytoplasm. For prokaryotic cells, please note that this process can occur simultaneous as transcription is occurring. This is one of the unique and biggest unique differences between eukaryotes and prokaryotes in their transcription translation. For eukaryotes, uh, where we have transcriptional processes occur, but then that mRNA transcript must be shuttled out of the nucleus for protein synthesis to occur. But in prokaryotic cells, you'll see that as that transcript is being formed, as soon as that ribosomal docking station or binding site is open and the first AUG is available, then you have the first docking of that or the, the initiation of translation. And in fact, even as that first ribosomal complex moves along and begins to transcribe this, a second ribosomal complex can come and dock and a third and a fourth and a fifth as soon as this, um, this docking station becomes available. So you'll find um, this incredible process that can, that's captured here with this electron micrograph where you have many, many uh, translational events occurring at the exact same uh, site or at the exact same time as transcription is still occurring um, for this particular protein. Okay, let's hold here for a second. Oops, I don't wanna do that yet. Okay, let me, let's go very briefly. Uh, where can I go here? I do wanna show you a video and I don't usually do this on these things, but let's just do this one. Um, yeah, we'll watch this one together.
So I will mention, I just paused this video. This is for eukaryotic cells. Eukaryotes have these introns and exons that uh, have to undergo splicing. For prokaryotic cells, this process does not need to occur. So we're gonna skip that part and then just move over to translation. All right, and then we have the folding of our polypeptide. Okay. So let's now do that. That conceptual understanding is important for you to know, but I also want you guys to be able to work through uh, what I call the shorthand version of transcription and translation. So using doing a problem like this, and I'll work through this one with you guys too. This question says using the mRNA codon chart to determine the mRNA transcript and the translated protein amino acid sequence or polypeptide product from the following DNA template. Now I'll put this on here, but I wanna show you kind of my, my uh, rule of how you do this process. So I've given you a double-stranded DNA molecule and the question asks you to transcribe and translate this double-stranded DNA molecule to find the polypeptide product using this mRNA codon chart. Now I'm gonna show you this next part is asking you to do the exact same thing with a tRNA anticodon chart and the, and the DNA strand is exactly the same. So. Before we get into this, let me just show you how I recommend you guys working through this process. Okay, I'm going to erase this part here. Uh, clear it. Okay. I'll just draw it out. So for transcription and translation shorthand problems, I guess I can just write it like this. Transcription, translation. Okay. Transcription and translation. The process. Number one, you're given a double stranded DNA molecule. Okay, so I'll just say this is with a double stranded DNA molecule. 
step number one, find your template. And you recall we said the template or the DNA strand that you will be reading for finding your mRNA transcript is always complementary to the transcript. And if transcription occurs from five to three, template is in three to five. Okay, so first find the template, and that'll be the three to five strand on the double stranded DNA molecule. Number two is transcribe. And don't forget to um, the rule of binding that adenines and DNA will be complementary to uracils in RNA, right? So transcribe that whole strand. So now we're done with that first part, transcription. Number three, find, remember that translation does not begin until the first AUG is bound by that transfer, um, tr uh, transfer molecule. So find the AUG start codon. Now, I just want to make a note. This is like a word search. So don't start if you have a sequence like this. Whoops. I was just going to write C. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Don't, if you have a sequence like this, Don't start at the beginning and group it with threes and try to find your AUG here. Now, if you're looking, you'll see that you've missed it. Don't do that. Instead, just go one at a time. A, C, G, C, A, U, G. Oh, you see it here. There's your AUG. And that's where your reading frame begins. So this shows you the start of translation. It also indicates your reading frame. So do not do it this way. Don't do it that way. Instead, just one nucleotide at a time until you find that AUG. And then from there, group it and then begin grouping your, your codons, right? So find the first AUG start codon and then you can group your, your codons. Every three, right? From here, there is there uh, is two different things to do. <laughs> Number one, if you are using an mRNA codon chart, then your number four is to find associated amino acids on the codon chart. And you're done. However, if, and I'll just draw this in a different color, if, however, you are using a tRNA anticodon chart. And I am sorry, but I am probably the only place on the entire, in your entire educational uh, career that you will find a transfer RNA codon chart. But I think it's very helpful in conceptually understanding what's happening in translation. So I think it's good practice for you, just a practice. So if you're using a transfer RNA anticodon chart, then your step number four is different. So remember, we're back at step three, where you had that trans transcript that you found the first AUG and you grouped your codons. So here, step number four is to find the transfer RNA anticodons. And then step number five will be find the associated 
amino acids on the anticodon chart. And then you're done. Okay, so uh, get this one down, write it down, and highlight it. This is a really a nice little key for you guys to use as you process through this uh, transcription and translation. So let's kind of go back and forth. I will do one of these with you, or I will do the, the start of this one with you, and then I want you guys to process the rest of this one, uh, maybe on your own. Actually, yeah, okay. Here is your double-stranded DNA molecule. Remember our rule. Step number one is find the template. Again, we remember our transcript is five to three, therefore our template is three to five. So hopefully you've identified already. Our template is, mm, let's do it in red. So this guy is our template. So we're going to start here, and I want you guys to always indicate orientation for the mRNA transcript. Let's go and change our color real quick. I don't know what color is going to show up here. Let's try blue. Okay. So we're going to start with orientation, and to find the transcript, Oh, I think we have neighbors over. Okay, so here's our three prime end. We're going to start here and say that our transcript will be, let's write out a messenger RNA. Okay, so we'll say our five prime. Ay, yeah, yeah. sorry guys. So we'll say this guy is our five prime end, and then we'll find our mRNA transcript. So here we have C, A, U, G, C, a, G, U, A, and then I want you guys to finish this one. Okay, step number two, wait, step one is find the template, step two is to transcribe. Step three is to find the first AUG. Remember, we're just gonna go nucleotide at a time. D, A, U, G, stop, we found it already. So here is our start codon, AUG, and we're just gonna highlight this, and then every three, Nucleotides will be the next or all subsequent uh, codons. So here's our next codon, and then I'll just give you one more here. Here's our next codon. And then you can continue this process as you continue to transcribe this. So we are now on step number four. We have to decide first if we are, we have to, here we just finished step number one, step two, step three. We just grouped our codons, and then step four, we have to decide if we're moving from here with the blue, black, or with the blue. So the uh, prompt says, if you're using an mRNA codon chart, which is exactly what we are using, then we just move to step number four, find the associated amino acids on the codon chart, and then we're finished. So let's go back up there to our PowerPoint. So here we are, we've identified our start codon and our subsequent codons. Now all we gotta do is look these guys up on our codon chart. Let me give you the first ones as examples for you. AUG, hopefully at this point, you know this is always gonna be associated with the F-methionine. So here we have AUG as our start codon, and this is methionine. So we'll put our first one up here. We'll say our amino acids. The first one is methionine. And the next one, CAG. Again, we'll look that up. Our first position is C, so we're here. Second position is A, so we're here. Third position is G, we're right here. Here's CAG, and that's associated with a glutamine. I think that's GLU. I could be wrong. Next is A, I'm sorry, UAC. UAC, again, we'll look that one up. U is on the top, A is over here, C is here, UAC. And this is associated with tyrosine, TYR. Okay, and so you would continue this process until you reach the end of this or until you reach a stop codon, 
at which point you would just say stop or you would just leave it empty. And that's the end of this process using an mRNA codon chart. Yeah, I want you guys to finish this one too and uh, I'll have you guys do that as an in-class discussion problem. Okay, let's see how you do this with a tRNA anti-codon chart. This one looks a little bit different. I, I have yet to find one that lays everything out nicely like the other one does. I'll probably just make that one on my own. So let's go through this process again. Um, if you recall, let me just go back over to our, let's go back over to our notes. So here again, we're doing transcription translation using a double-stranded DNA molecule, but this time we're gonna jump down to the blue when we get down to the bottom part. But we're gonna start with steps one, two, and three, exactly the same. Find the template, transcribe that template, and then find that first AUG and then group the codons as accordingly. So here we go. The template this is exactly the same sequence. I did this on purpose because I want you guys to see that you should have the exact same amino acid product at the end. So let's start here. This is our template. We'll do our mRNA here. And we know mRNA begins. I think it just doesn't like me doing things in straight lines. So you don't get any straight lines from me doing this. So here's our five prime end. Again, we'll start here. C, A, U, G, C, A, G, U. I don't know how many, many I need. Okay, this is, this is good so far. Okay, so here we have step one, find the template. Step two, find the mRNA transcript. Step three, find the AUG. I've already shown you this one since this is the exact same sequence. So here is our first, here's our first AUG. And again, we'll group them with groups of three. Here's our second codon. Now for, um, MR, for transfer RNA molecules, remember that we, we just finished step number three. So we grouped our codons. So we don't have an mRNA codon chart. This time we have a tRNA anti-codon chart. So we're skip, skipping down here to step number four. Now we gotta go back and find the transfer RNA anti-codons that are associated with those codons we just circled. And then we can look this thing up on the transfer RNA codon chart. So let's do just these two examples that I just gave you. Okay, so our transfer RNA, let me just change the color for you. Okay, so next step is to find the transfer RNA anticodons. You don't need to worry about orientation this time, but we're just gonna start with this first codon. To find the anticodon, it's just gonna be the complementary nucleotides in RNA, so A's will be complementary to U's, U's are complementary to A's, and G's are complementary to C's. So here's our first transfer RNA molecule, anticodon. Let's do the next one. C is complementary to G, adenines are complementary to uracils, guanines complementary to cytosines. Here's our second transfer RNA anticodon, and you would continue this down through your whole transcript and all of the codons that you'd identified in, amino, in the mRNA. Now the last step is to look up each of these anticodons on the tRNA anticodon chart. So UAC is what we're starting. These are in alphabetical order at least. So we'll go over here to, the, to where the U's are. UAC is associated with an methionine, as we already know. It's gonna get a little bit messy. So here's M or methionine. G-U-C, again, it's alphabetical, so G-U-C down here. Well, I think I was right with my three-letter abbreviation. I think I was wrong. Is a glutamine, G-L-U. And then you would continue this process down. You can also go back into this chart and find the single-letter abbreviations for each of these things, and then you can kind of write these out in single-letter single codes if you'd like to. That'll be helpful with the um, practice exercise I have for you, um, which I'll talk to you guys about during our discussion time. Um, but for now, this is a sufficient way to answer this question. And then you can check yourself. And I like doing this way because it allows you to check to see um, your answers for the first time around. Your answers for your amino acid product should be exactly the same. So far we have methionine and glutamine. If you saw before, it should be exactly the same. We got methionine and glutamine, right? Glutamine. Yep. So as you continue these two uh, transcription, translation processes, 
you should at the very end get exactly the same thing, okay? So I want you again, as an in-class discussion problem, this will be one of your assignments. As mentioned, eukaryotes have a very similar process for transcription translation. One thing to note though, they have these unique, we have these unique regions in our gene segments called introns. These are non-coding regions that are important in many different um, processes, but they uh, must be spliced out or cut out to make our final mRNA transcript. And just so you see what this looks like, this is a, a picture from your book and really this is the extent of what you need to know about this. So for eukaryotic cells, we have still transcription and tra uh, transcription, exactly the same as we mentioned before, but before translation, these little intron or non-coding regions need to be spliced out, cut out of the double-stranded DNA molecule to make this, to make the final um, mRNA transcript before that process of translation. So here is this, they're called spliceosomes that are formed, these cool um, enzymatic units that come in and splice out this mRNA transcript. If you ever get into immunology, you'll get really deep into this concept here. We have a lot of splicing that happens during the production of our immune cells. And we'll talk about it super briefly in our chapter on immunology. In the end, you have a mature mRNA transcript that then is shuttled out of the nucleus and can be translated into a protein product, much like we saw with prokaryotic cells. That's the end of these slides. We made it all the way through. Um, on the next sets of slides, then we'll talk through mutations and uh, the consequences of those mutations. We'll also look at DNA um, repair machinery, and we'll look at the process of how bacterial cells can share and modify their genetic information. Okay.